Democracy is governmental rule by the people. But how many presidents really know or represent ordinary citizens? Due to the power a president wields, the office often attracts strong and wealthy members of society. But Germany's first president came from a much humbler background. How did a saddle maker turned pub owner become the first president of Germany? While his life may surprise you, it left him with strong convictions regarding the importance of the average citizen and made him unwaveringly devoted to democracy. World War I left a lasting impression on the world. Many people still know the horrific conditions inside the trenches and the shocking death toll that shocked the world. Every country involved suffered due to the war, but Germany was one of the most affected. Germany was on the losing side when it was over and the Allied powers wanted to punish somebody for the past few years of suffering. The Treaty of Versailles left Germany with a broken economy and an overflow of animosity. Luckily, the German people were resilient. In this challenging time, they set up their first democracy, and their first president was Friedrich Ebert. President Ebert helped restore order and peace to his country. Although his strict policies against left-wing politics have made him a controversial figure, to better understand Germany following World War I, it is essential to look into the life of Friedrich Ebert. He was a critical part of German politics until 1925, and his influence shaped the country during this vulnerable time in history. How did Friedrich Ebert grow up? Friedrich Ebert was born in Heidelberg on February 4, 1871, to Karl and Katharina Ebert. Friedrich had eight other siblings growing up, although three did not survive to adulthood. His father was a master tailor. This meant the family budget was tight and there was no money to send Friedrich to university like he wanted. Instead, Friedrich became a saddle maker, learning from 1885 to 1888. He then began traveling his country in 1889 as a journeyman, plying his trade and even starting and leading several local chapters of the Association of Saddlers, called the Sattlerverband. However, Friedrich Ebert had more interests than only making saddles, but he also slipped into the political arena accidentally. While he was in Mannheim as a journeying saddle maker, one of his uncles introduced him to the Social Democratic Party. Friedrich Ebert was intrigued and joined in 1889. His political activities placed him on the police blacklist for a time, forcing him to move several times between 1889 and 1891. While he did read Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, he wasn't interested in communistic ideology. Instead, he wanted to improve lives for the working class, which included people like him, by fixing the organizational and practical issues working people had to deal with. Siding with the modern socialist democrats, Friedrich wanted to focus on functional moral and social improvements without worrying about ideology. Friedrich Ebert finally settled in Bremen in 1891. In 1893, he procured an editorial position with the Bremen Burger Zeitung, a socialist publication, and in 1894 he married Louise Rump, who was active in the unions. Ebert became a pub owner shortly afterward. His pub quickly became a center for union and socialist activity. Ebert soon became the party chairman of the Social Democratic Party branch in Bremen. By 1900, the national public was becoming familiar with Friedrich Ebert. He was a trade union secretary and had been elected to the Bremer Bürgerschaft as one of the Social Democratic Party's representatives. The Bremer Bürgerschaft was the state legislature of Bremen. Friedrich became known as a moderate in the party, soon rising as a leader. In 1905, he was the party's secretary general, causing him to move to Berlin. He was only 34 years old at the time, making him the youngest person in the party's executive membership. As the secretary general, Friedrich used his organizational skills to update the party filing systems and add typewriters to help manage the party's growing membership and assets. Friedrich's drive and organizational talents continued to carry him onto the national political stage. He ran for Germany's federal parliament, called the Reichstag, several times but was not elected until 1912. That election made the Socialist Democratic Party the most influential in the Reichstag. Ebert was working in national politics but the start of World War I would soon throw all of Germany into chaos. They would need great leaders like Friedrich Ebert to see them through the next 15 years of war and the struggle to rebuild. How did Friedrich Ebert become Germany's first president? World War I hit Germany hard. 
Friedrich Ebert was one of the leaders of the Socialist Democratic Party, which supported the country's involvement in the war. The party's war policies led to a split in 1917, as the left-wing members formed the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany. This new political party opposed the war effort. Another faction also left in 1917 to form the Communist Party of Germany, which wanted a revolution. It became clear in the summer and fall of 1918 that Germany had lost the war, and its politicians began looking for ways to restructure the country. A monarchy was no longer a viable option, so they began examining how to move the government to a parliamentary model. Friedrich Ebert encouraged his party to join the new government led by Prince Maximilian of Baden. Their new government wanted sweeping reforms, urging the Allied powers to negotiate peace with Germany. Part of the reason Friedrich Ebert supported the new government was that he opposed the idea of a social revolution. But even the new government could not stop the revolution in November 1918. Many of the German people could not accept they had lost the war, and the Communist Party was ready to spread revolution. The German Revolution of 1918 to 1919 started on October 29 and quickly spread, reaching Berlin on November 9. Ebert, as the head of the Socialist Democratic Party, began working swiftly to quell the revolution by asking for a more influential voice in the executive cabinet and demanding Kaiser Wilhelm II and his son renounce their claims to the throne. The Kaiser refused to abdicate, even as the strikes and protests spread. In frustration, Prince Maximilian announced the Kaiser had resigned anyway and gave Friedrich Ebert his own governmental position. The former saddlemaker was now the Chancellor of Germany and Minister President of Prussia. While the move was unconstitutional, it allowed Ebert to start bringing Germany back under control. Friedrich Ebert held the Chancellor's office for a whole day, then adopted the revolution, taking on both the government's leadership and revolution in an attempt to bring the two into compromise. Under Ebert, Germany set up a socialist provisional government called the Council of the People's Deputies. It was based on workers' councils, and Ebert was careful to ensure many of the groups were filled with social democratic supporters. He had to work with the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany, much to his annoyance, but his focus on compromise and the betterment of the state won out over ideological differences. With his new government, Ebert was finally able to enact various social reforms, including unemployment benefits, universal suffrage, including for women, and an eight-hour workday. He also established freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and freedom of religion. The provisional government helped the country restabilize by getting food supplies moving again to help feed a starving, war-torn population. By early 1919, many German people were content with the new government. They no longer saw a need for a revolution because life was getting better for them. However, a group of far-left extremists called the Spartacists were still discontent because communism had not been fully established. Ebert planned to move the power from the workers' councils to an elected German parliament as soon as possible, which was not enough change for some in the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany. They did not like that he had cooperated with the elite of the old regime, claiming he had betrayed the labor movement. In response, the Spartacists split from the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany in December and set out on January 5, 1919 to stop the parliamentary democracy from establishing itself during its first election set for January 19. The revolutionaries took over railway stations and newspapers on January 5 and planned to take over the government the next day. However, military help did not come to their rescue. Instead, Eber began negotiating with the revolution leaders while also prepping to halt the revolution using force. From January 9th to the 12th, he ordered the military to put down the January uprising swiftly and harshly to save the German government. The two founders of the German Communist Party were murdered shortly afterward. Although both Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg have since become critical people in German history. On January 19, 1919, Germany had its parliamentary elections. The three main political parties, including the Social Democratic Party, elected the first president, choosing Friedrich Ebert to lead the country into a new age under the Weimar Constitution. Even after all this chaos, though, Ebert still had much work to do. His time as president was met with mixed reviews by his contemporaries, leaving some of his legacy a controversial tangle that historians are still sifting through today. What impact did Friedrich Ebert have as Germany's first president? 
Ebert had to steer Germany through several crises during his short time as president, and one of the most considerable strains came from the Treaty of Versailles. Many Germans, including Ebert, believed the Treaty of Versailles was intended to ruin Germany, mainly because the Germans had no say in negotiations. Germany had to give up all overseas colonies, severely restrict its army, and pay heavy war reparations as punishment for the war. Germany had to pay over 100 billion gold marks. Such payments were not sustainable, but Friedrich Ebert knew that the Allied powers would invade if Germany did not sign. However, the radical nationalists did not like the treaty and attempted a coup d'etat in 1920. They were unsuccessful. Ebert had more crises coming, though. The Allied powers declared Germany in default of their coal deliveries in January 1923, so France took over the Ruhr region. Germany attempted to fight back with a general strike, but this also hurt Germany, staggeringly raising inflation and causing social issues as millions became idle. Through working with other political leaders, the president was able to help evacuate the region, end inflation with economic reform, and even reduce their reparations with help from the Americans. Although Friedrich Ebert was focused on bettering Germany, he faced slander and hostility from the radical left and right. The left believed the president had betrayed their revolution. The right was still mourning the loss of the German Empire. Both sides thought overthrowing Ebert's government would solve their problems, so the president faced several coups or rebellions while in office. Despite it all, Ebert remained Germany's stable anchor for the six years he was president. His focus on democracy and bettering the working class never wavered, even as Germany dealt with economic crises and threats from the Allied powers. Friedrich Ebert died on February 28, 1925. His death saw the end of Germany's stability after World War I. By 1933, Adolf Hitler had come to power, starting one of Germany's darkest moments in its history. However, Ebert's dream of democracy was not lost. Germany today celebrates strong democratic ideals, proving that Friedrich Ebert truly understood the people and wanted what was best for his country, even though he worked during one of the country's most difficult times. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about German history, check out our book, History of Germany, A Captivating Guide to German History, Starting from 1871 Through the First World War, Weimar Republic, and World War II to the Present. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.